very good evening aspirants i welcome you all to the hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by shankar ias academy today's date is 27th september 2023 before we begin our discussion i have an important announcement to make the much awaited pre stomic test series by shankar ias academy is about to begin the batch 2 of the test series is going to start from october 15 the other details regarding the test series are displayed here please have a look at it now without much delay let us get into the discussion take a look at this news article the news article is yesterday union home ministry extended the armed forces special power act in parts of nagaland and arunachal pradesh this act was further extended for a period of 6 months starting from october 1 guys this is all about the news now in this discussion we shall see some important facts about armed special power act afspa which will be very helpful for our exams now let us get into the news discussion here let's look at the origin of the act the act dates back to the british era it was promulgated by the british government in response to the quit india movement in 1942 after independence it was retained and was made as an act in 1958 initially the act was enacted to deal with the naga insurgency in the northeastern state of assam but later the scope of the act was extended to other areas that faced similar armed conflict or insurgency such as nagaland manipur meghalaya and so on so as the act was extended to further areas the purpose of the act got changed here let us see about the purpose of aspa the main purpose of the act is to maintain peace in the disturbed areas this act grants special power to the indian armed forces and paramilitary forces to maintain law and order in disturbed areas apart from this this act also allowed the armed forces to aid the civil administration in the peace disturbed areas so now we shall see where are the areas in which the aspa is currently applicable see the aspa is currently applicable to some areas in four northeastern states of india these states are assam arunachal pradesh nagaland and manipur apart from northeastern states the aspa is also currently applicable in the union territory of jammu and kashmir however there is a difference here it was administered under a special act called armed forces jammu and kashmir special power act 1990 here this act was enacted to deal with the growing insurgency in the kashmir valley during the 90s having seen this basics now let us look into the important provisions of the act according to the act the term armed forces means the armed forces of union government and it's excluding the state police forces from this definition then moving on the section 2 bar b as the act provides for the ground to declare an area to be a disturbed area according to this act a whole of the state or a part of a state can be declared as a disturbed area now we should be aware of the definition of the term disturbed area in aspa here under section 3 of the act a disturbed area is an area which is in a disturbed or unstable condition which demands the use of armed forces to aid the civil power now we can see who can declare disturbed areas it's also provided under section 3 of the act as per section 3 the union government or governor in case of a state or an administrator in case of a union territory can declare an area as a disturbed area now moving on in our discussion we shall see some special powers granted to armed forces under afspa the special powers are were granted under section 4 of the afspa it gives certain wide power to the authorized officer according to section 4 the authorized officer can open fire or he can use the force against the persons who can act against law and order apart from this section 4 of the act also confers special powers to the armed forces to search the place or to seize the property without any warrant the armed forces can also arrest the person based on mere suspicion even without a warrant so here the main criticism of the aspa is in the section 7 it's clearly stated that there is no persecution or legal proceedings against the security personnel without the prior approval of central government now having seen this main criticism to review the existing provisions of the aspa g1 ready commission was formed in 2004 so to review the provisions of aspa g1 ready commission was formed in 2004 now we saw basic information about aspa now before concluding let us have a recap of what we saw in this discussion we first saw about the genesis of aswa its purpose and the areas where it is currently in operation fourth the main provisions of the act fifth we saw the criticism of the act 
6th Nisa about Jeevan Reddy Commission which was formed to review the act with this basic information we shall conclude this analysis and let us move on to the next article take a look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about the recent report of the intergovernmental panel on climate change ipcc this report severely warns that the climate change is increasing the global risk of infectious diseases here the author highlights the correlation between climate change and increasing in infectious diseases with the evidences and he also suggests some of the measures to overcome the threat this is all about the news article guys yesterday we asked your opinion on whether continuing the editorial with the old approach or the new answer based approach thank you for your all winning response as many of you have liked the new approach let us try this article in a mains perspective before getting into the discussion let us look into the syllabus in the preliminary this discussion will fall under the general science part in mains it comes under general studies 3 under the topic of conservation environmental pollution and degradation eia environmental impact assessment guys let us start the discussion look at this question the question asked is explain the intricate relationship between climate change and the high end risk of infectious diseases also suggest the strategies and measures to mitigate the growing threat in indian context see this question was a 10 mark question we should be answered within the world limit of 150 words guys now you can pause the video and do a brainstorming for 2 minutes see brainstorming is not a rocket science just list the points which you think which can be written for this answer and design upon the structure which you can arrange the points now coming back to our discussion the key word in the question is explain see when explain is given in the question the candidate is expected to give a clear account on why something happens he or she should clarify the concepts with relevant facts and implications now let us see how to approach this specific question the question asks to explain the relationship which is intricate the intricate relationship between cc climate change and high end global risk of infectious diseases so in the introduction you can quote any relevant findings of a recent report to link the two keywords that is climate change and diseases and the question itself is very structured with having it two parts so the main body of the answer can also be split into two in the first part you can write how climate change will have an impact on infectious diseases and in the second part you can suggest some strategies to mitigate this growing threat in the conclusion part you can write a balanced conclusion in this regard so this is how we are going to approach this question let us start with the introduction in the introduction part as i have already mentioned you can write the findings of any relevant report for example you can quote the ipcc report which was made in the news today you can write like this like according to the 6th assessment report of ipcc many infectious diseases are climate sensitive so the increase in temperature due to climate change can interfere with the genomic structure of pathogens and change the two important parameters their infectivity and the virulence the variability in the precipitation humidity due to extreme climate change can disrupt the transmission cycle of the diseases and moreover you can alter the distribution of vectors and animal reservoirs which are the host of parasites here i have mentioned a parameter called virulence it means the severity or harmfulness of a disease and animal reservoirs means an animal species inside of which a pathogen survives i can give you an example a bacterium vibrio cholerae which causes cholera in humans has a natural reservoirs in shellfish zooplankton etc i think hope you understand this could be a good intro for our question now come back to body of the answer in the first part you should write how climate change will have an impact on diseases the points which can be written are firstly climate change increases the risk of human animal interaction and here thereby there will be a transfer of pathogens from wildlife to humans why this is happening means this is happening mainly due to the loss of habitat of the disease carrying animals when the habitat is lost due to climate change they will encroach upon the human territory this intensify the human animal interaction and the transfer of pathogens from wildlife to animals remember viruses which do not harm animals 
can be also fatal for humans. A very good example is Nipah virus, which do not harm bats but can be fatal for humans. Second point, diseases often find new transmission routes from once reliable sources. Such transmission routes include environmental sources, medical tourism, contaminated food and water. Since climate change is transforming, altering the ecosystems, new invasive species gets introduced into the ecosystem, and the range of existing life forms in the ecosystem also get extended. This causes a sudden change in the ecosystem and leads to the confusion during prediction of the outbreaks. Thirdly, climate change will shift the seasons like early summer, erratic monsoons, led to unseasonal outbreak of diseases. For example. A recent dengue epidemic in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Kolkata, and the Nifa outbreak in Kerala. Fourthly, climate change can influence the survival, development, and reproduction of infectious disease-causing pathogens. For example, the recent increase in the number of reported cases infected with brain-eating amoeba. See, this particular amoeba lives in fresh water, and they love warm water. They can enter the body. through nose travel to brain and start to destroy the tissues see this is a fatal infection so with the rise in temperature of the surface water we are actually providing it a better option to survive on continuing our discussion climate change alters the disease vector distribution helps in the proliferation of vector borne diseases and brings changes in the pathogen survival and reproduction models so by including these points we can explain the intricate relationship between climate change and infectious diseases now moving on to the second part of the question that is giving some suggestions or measure to overcome the threat in indian context the question clearly asked in indian context now you can mention about the revision of strategies to detect and deal with them see a web enabled near real time electronic information system called integrated health information platform IHIP was launched in 2018 it provides updates and real time tracking of the emerging disease outbreaks for nearly 33 diseases but the outcome of the program was not up to the mark as it was expected but such real time monitoring program should be revamped to help us detecting the diseases at the earlier stage as with the old saying goes what could be measured can be managed second suggestion is improving the current design of surveillance guys we need active pathogen surveillance here the one health approach in mitigating the spread of climate change induced diseases is a viable solution in this context i will give you a little brief about one health one health is a collaborative multi sector and transdisciplinary approach working from local level to global level their objective is to achieve optimal health outcomes by recognizing and understanding the interconnection between people animals plants and their shared environment it encompasses zoonotic diseases neglected tropical diseases vector borne diseases antimicrobial resistance which is a cause of concern for the developing countries and environmental contamination so this approach can effectively prevent the outbreaks especially those that originate from animals thirdly India can launch its own health and infectious disease control programs by building greater synergies between center and states and their varied specialist agencies this will build trust and confidence enabling the ease in sharing the data and devise logical line of responsibilities you can write this three points as measures now coming to the concluding part you can conclude by saying that climate change is not limited to infectious diseases it can also increases the injuries and death caused by extreme weather respiratory disorders cardiovascular disorders and remember climate change will also increase mental health problems so protecting the ecosystems fostering collaboration and embracing the one health paradigm are the best solution to mitigate the threats this is all about the news discussion see the points which i covered are like the skeletons of the answer you can write your own points and you should match them with our model answer given here in this way you can see your ability to write the relevant answer you will consistently grow up and you will be familiar with the answer writing practices and you will be familiar with the skill of mains answer writing 
So with this learned points, let us take up the next news article for our discussion. Look at this editorial article. This editorial is all about the criticism on India's ambitious Aadhaar system. Let us get into the discussion. Recently, an organization called Moody, which is a global rating agency, has raised a concern about India's Aadhaar program. Its report highlighted the potential security and privacy risks which are associated with the centralized system of Aadhaar. I hope you would be aware of the recent government an- announcement. Recently, government announced that the MG Narega payments will be only done through Aadhaar based system. This decision of the government is questioned by Moody. It specifically raised concerns about the reliability of Aadhaar's biometric authentication, especially for the manual laborers who are working under hot and humid conditions. Already, there have been many issues with fingerprints and retina scans in many areas of the country. This difficulty in biometric authentication might lead to the denial of services for the marginalized citizens of this country. So, in this article, it raises various questions and given drawbacks about Aadhaar system. Now, let us see what are the important concerns about the Aadhaar system which are given in this news article. Before entering the news discussion, let us see the syllabus regarding this topic which is given here for your reference. Let us begin the discussion. Now, we shall see criticism regarding Aadhaar one by one. This will be very useful if a question about Aadhaar is given in the form of critically analysis because here we have to criticize the various provisions of the Aadhaar. Now, let us get into the analysis. First concern is regarding the reliability of auth- biometric authentication. See, Aadhaar uses iris and fingerprint scans for biometric authentication. This is aimed to achieve high accuracy in identification. But on the flip side, it may not always work perfectly. Sometimes people need to try multiple times, which can be frustrating and time consuming. And if the biometrics are not identified properly, it may seriously result in the deprivation of essential services. For example, there are many incidents happened in India where the rations were denied due to technical glitches and non-approval of fingerprints by EPOS machine, that is E point of sale machine. On continuing our discussion, the next important concern is regarding the privacy. This article mentions an audit which was recently conducted by Comptroller and Auditor General of India, which is CAG. It found that privacy lapses and data security problems in Aadhaar. There are many cases of Aadhaar data breaches and unauthorized access to Aadhaar data were happened in country which was highlighted in this report. While many private companies record Aadhaar information for their business, but we don't know how they protect the privacy of the data. As the country is still working on the bill to ensure personal data protection, this is a serious concern regarding Aadhaar system. Moving on to the next important concern is exclusion. Some individuals have been excluded from the basic services due to lack of Aadhaar. As we have seen earlier, the government has adopted the Aadhaar system for paying MG MG Narega beneficiaries. This may lead to many irregularities in timely payment of dues and exclusion from social benefits. Another important concern is about duplication. While the flaws in the enrollment process have led to the duplication in Aadhaar system, this may increase the financial burden to the government and also creates problems for actual beneficiaries. Thus, it may create many problems while solving few. Next important issue is regarding Aadhaar Enabled Payment System AEPS. Now let us look into AEPS. What does AEPS means? It is a service that allows people with Aadhaar linked bank account to withdraw money across India through a banking correspondent. Even though it is a watershed move in achieving financial inclusion, however, there have been widespread cases of misuse by dishonest BCs, that is business correspondents. Lastly, an important concern is regarding the old aged people and manual laborers. Registering laborers and rural citizens for Aadhaar has been very challenging because they frequently have unclear fingerprints by the virtue of their occupation as manual laborers. Additionally, elder people with dry hands or weak iris scans have encountered difficulties in the process. So this poses a serious concern regarding their accessibility to social security benefits. Lastly, other uses centralized system of data storage. The Moody agency suggests that a decentralized form of ID systems will be much safer than the centralized system. 
This is because decentralized system gives users more control over their data. To conclude our discussion, Aadhaar are providing opportunities and challenges as two sides of the same coin. While the government perceives Aadhaar as a base to improve the country's digital infrastructure, the government should review and fix Aadhaar's issues before expanding its usage in areas such as electoral rules, giving to private companies or MGNR payments. This is all about the news discussion. Before we take up the next article, let us have a recap about what we understood from this discussion. See, this discussion started on Moody's report on Aadhaar and we have come across various criticism on Aadhaar's regarding its reliability, privacy, exclusion, duplication and concerns of socially disadvantaged people like manual laborers and old age etc. Here, make a note of the points which we discussed and revise it often. So, with this learned points, let us move on to the next news article. Look at this news article. Yesterday, a three judge bench of the Supreme Court decided to hear the review petitions against a July 2022 verdict of the Supreme Court. This verdict mainly deals with the Prevention of Money Laundering Act or PMLA Act. In July 2022, the Supreme Court in its verdict gave a wide range of powers to the Enforcement Directorate. These powers include the right to arrest and summon individuals and the power to search private properties under a PMLA Act. So, aggrieved by this, some people have filed a review petition in the Supreme Court on the ground that the powers deprives the basic rights of the accused persons. This court will hear the review petitions from October 18. This is the crux of the news. So, in this discussion, let us understand some important points about the Prevention of Money Laundering Act or PMLA Act. To start with, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act was enacted by the Parliament in 2002. As the name of the Act itself mentions the word prevention, this Act was enacted to combat money laundering in India. Now, what does the term money laundering means? Simply, money laundering means the process of hiding the source of money that is obtained from illegal activities like drug trafficking, corruption, terror financing, etc. So, money laundering poses a serious threat to the financial security of the country and it may indirectly lead to terror attacks. Mostly, in this process, the money obtained from such illegal activities are hidden and later they are converted into clean money to avoid any prosecution under law. So, we can safely say that the money laundering helps in converting black money into white money. So, to deal with this dangerous money laundering activity, India enacted the Prevention of Money Laundering Act in 2002, which came into force from 2005. The central government also notified certain rules from time to time under PMLA Act to combat money laundering. So, having these basics, let us discuss about the main implementing bodies of this Act. They are Financial Intelligence Unit India FIU and the Enforcement Directorate. Here, the Financial Intelligence Unit India is the national agency which is responsible for receiving, processing, analyzing and disseminating information related to suspect financial transaction. Based on the report from FIU Hind, the ED will take action against the suspected individuals or organizations under the PMLA. Now, with this basic information, let us look into the objective of the Act. The Act has three main objectives. Firstly, the Act aims to prevent and control money laundering activity in the country. Secondly, the Act aims to confiscate and seize the property which are obtained from such money laundering money. And finally, the Act strives to deal with any other issue connected with money laundering in India. This is all about the objectives. Now, let us see some of the important provisions of the PMLA Act. First, let us take Section 4 of the Act. This section mainly deals with the punishment aspects of the Act. According to Section 4, anyone who involves in money laundering activity shall be punishable with a rigorous imprisonment of not less than 3 years. This can be further extended to 7 years. Apart from this, the convicted person shall also be liable to pay fine. Secondly, let us take Section 26 of the Act. According to the section, if any person 
is aggrieved by the orders of the adjudicating authorities like ED then he can appeal to appellate tribunal here the appeal should be made within 45 days on the date of receiving of the order but there is an exception when the appellate tribunal satisfies that there was a sufficient cause for not filing the appeal within the set period then it can also entertain such appeals and there is also a provision of second appeal is present in this act any person who is aggrieved by the orders of the appellate tribunal can approach the high court and finally let us take section 73 this section empowers the central government to make rules for carrying out the provisions of the pmla so the central government can notify the rules from time to time to enforce the provisions of the pmla these are some of the important provisions of the pmla act so make a note of it and revise it often as this will be asked in our examination so with this points let us move on to the next news article look at this news article yesterday our external affairs minister s jay shankar addressed the 78th session of united nation general assembly while addressing the session he proclaimed that an era where only few nations set the agenda has over and he stressed that a fair equitable and democratic order will surely emerge sooner or later in this context let us quickly go through some of the important points about the unga from our exam perspective see the unga was established in 1945 under the charter of united nations the body is a chief deliberative policy making and representative organ of the united nation interestingly all 193 members of the united nation are represented in the general assembly which makes it a only body with universal representation see the assembly provides a unique forum for multilateral discussions involving international issues that are covered under the chapter the important deliberations and decisions are taken by voting here there is a little difference in the voting process depends upon the process on which the voting is done here voting on important questions such as peace and security admission of new members budgetary matters require a two thirds of majority where decisions on other questions are done by a simple majority the assembly also plays a significant role in the process of standard setting and codification of international law remember each year in september the full un membership meets in the general assembly hall in new york for the annual unga session where the head of the states will be addressing their view points on continuing our discussion let us know that the president of the assembly changes with each annual session and it is elected by the body itself while it is done by a secret ballot and requires a simple majority vote of the general assembly having seen the structure let us see the function of the unga the unga president is empowered to enforce rule of procedures includes opening a debate setting the agenda limiting the speaking time for representative and suspending or adjoining the debate here we need to look that the president of the unga rotates among the five regional groups which includes group of asian states group of eastern european countries group of latin american and caribbean countries group of african states and the western european and other state groups and as per the established rules of the regional rotation policy the president of the 78th ga was to be elected from the group of latin american and caribbean states on continuing our discussion about the functions of the unga it also elects the non permanent members of the security council and other un bodies such as human rights council and it also will it also appoints the secretary general based on security council's recommendation apart from this its other function include consideration of the reports from other organs of the un assessing the financial condition of the member states and to approve of un budget that's all about the analysis about unga in this analysis we first saw about the basic details about unga like its establishment its members the voting pattern and the distinction between the voting pattern on continuing our discussion we saw about the rotation policy of the presidentship of the unga and we also saw about the functions of unga here make a note of it and revise it often such that the facts will be assimilated into our intelligence so with this learned points let us move on to the next news article look at this front page article yesterday the supreme court said that the indian judiciary is losing its talent human resource pool 
the supreme court highlighted that there are huge vacancies of judges in the high court the apex court also noted that the central government is not acting properly on the recommendation of the collegium regarding the appointment and transfer of the judges this is all about the news here in this discussion let us understand some points about the collegium system and we also see some points about the status of indian judiciary as it was given in the article now let us start with the collegium system the collegium system refers to the system of appointment and transfer of judges in the echelons of higher judiciary such as supreme court and high court know that in india the collegium system has emerged and evolved through a series of judgments of supreme court in the various famous judges cases noting an important fact here that the collegium system was not enacted by an act of parliament or through provisions of the constitutions whereas the collegium system is an example of judicial innovation see having this basic let us see the types of collegiums functioning in india in india we have two types of collegiums one is supreme court collegium and the other one is high court collegium now first let us take the supreme court collegium into discussion see the supreme court collegium consists of chief justice of india and the four senior most judges of the supreme court the chief justice of india is the head of the supreme court collegium this five member collegium decides on the appointment of judges to the supreme court here the appointment of supreme court judges can be made in two forms firstly it could be done in the form of elevation here the high court judges got elevated and appointed as the judges of supreme court secondly the appointments is done through direct appointments here the experienced lawyers may be directly appointed as the supreme court judges remember here that the both the two types of appointments are to be decided by a five member supreme court collegium see there is also an another one type of supreme court collegium and we will discuss it while discussing the collegium of high court now let us move on to high court collegium see like the supreme court the high court is also having a collegium the high court collegium consists of chief justice of high court and two senior most judges of the particular high court here the high court collegium decides on the appointment of the judges of high court in the form of elevation or direct appointment for a conceptual understanding remember that the high court collegium only has the power to send recommendations once it identify a suitable judge the high court collegium will send the recommendation to the union law ministry the law ministry will in turn forward the recommendations to the supreme court here comes another type of collegium see to deal with the high court appointments the supreme court collegium consists of three members only that is it comprises of chief justice of india and two senior most judges of the supreme court this three member supreme court collegium deals with the recommendations being sent by high court collegium and it will take a final call regarding the appointments once they decide on appointments three member collegium will send the proposal again to the law ministry for final ap- approval and appointments here we can see another fact also like this three member collegium also decides on the transfer of high court judges in our country so remember once again that the five member collegium deals with the appointment of judges to the supreme court and the three member supreme court collegium deals with the recommendations of the high court collegium and the transfers of the high court judges this is all about the conceptual understanding of the collegium system now moving on to our next part of article here we shall see the status of indian judiciary as mentioned in the article here you can look at the chart here according to this news article the data in the chart is sourced from the department of justice and national judicial data grid here we can see that out of 1114 sanctioned strength of the judges in the high court almost 340 positions are vacant this means effectively one third of the positions of the high court judges are vacant in our country simultaneously if you look at the pending cases it is also very high in the high court with nearly 6 million pending cases now moving on to the supreme court see out of the sanctioned strength of 34 judges two positions are vacant here also the pending cases stood at approximately 80500 from this facts we can observe that 
there is a huge pendency of cases in the Indian judiciary. This is directly correlated to the huge vacancies in the Indian judiciary. So, the government should act upon the recommendations of the Collegium in a time-bound manner. This helps the judiciary to provide better delivery of justices. That's all about the news discussion. With this, let us move on to the next part of our video. That is preliminary practice questions. Today, we are having four questions. Let us solve them one by one. See, the first question is considering the following states. Given the states are all from northeastern states. The first one is Assam, Tripura, Nagaland, Meghalaya, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh. In how many of the above mentioned states, the AFSPA is currently applicable? See, from our news analysis discussion, we can easily decipher that the AFSPA is currently applicable in four northeastern states of Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland and Manipur. So, the correct option is option B, only four. See, the second question is, which one of the following body is responsible for investigating the offences of money laundering under the PMLA Act 2002? Here, the set of options given are Income Tax Department, Central Economic Intelligence Bureau, Enforcement Directorate, and National Investigation Agency. So, from our news discussion, we can easily say the correct option is option C, Enforcement Directorate. Moving on to our third question, which of the following statements regarding the UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, is true? So, the first option here is UNGA consists of representative from all member states. UNGA consists of representative from all member states. See, the option is correct because you know from our news discussion that UNGA is the only universal body with having representation from all member states of the United Nations. So, the correct option is option A. Moving on to fourth question, consider the following statements regarding the Collegium system of India. The Collegium system of appointing and transferring the judges in India has clearly described in the Indian constitution. Statement 2 is, the final decision of the Supreme Court Collegium is binding on the government. From our discussion, we can easily say that the first statement for one is incorrect as the Collegium system was not enacted neither by an act of parliament nor it was given in the constitution. It is a judicial innovative initiative. So the statement one is wrong. Regarding the second statement, the central government is bound to act on the recommendation of the Supreme Court Collegium. So the statement two is correct. So the correct option will be option B. These four questions are from the prelims question. The main question based on today's discussion is listed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC's civil service preparation, please subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you for listening. Thank you.